give him the glory. And Lord, we say prepare us today, Father, to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. Lord, and with thanksgiving, we'll be a living sanctuary for you. Hallelujah. We give you all the glory, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Oh, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving, I'll be Nothing. Withholding nothing. Come on. I 
surrender. I surrender to you. Everything I give. Cry today, withholding. Withholding nothing. Everything that I have, I give, Lord. Hallelujah. Withholding nothing. Hallelujah. Withholding. Withholding nothing. Raise your voice and tell Him, I, I surrender. Withholding nothing. We give it all to you, Lord. Withholding nothing. I give you my mind, my heart, my soul. Withholding nothing. My life, my dreams, withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Here I am, Lord, withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Hallelujah. I give myself to you. Withholding nothing. I give myself away. Withholding nothing, hallelujah. Withholding nothing. I surrender, hallelujah. I surrender. I surrender to you. We give you the yes, Lord, in this house. Everything. Everything. Everything I give. I give. Withholding nothing, withholding nothing, withholding nothing, withholding nothing, withholding nothing, withholding nothing. So, Father, we come and we stand, we sit, we bow in your presence. We pray that you will receive the offering of our worship. We bless you that you have sanctified us in your blood and we are called by your name. Now, Father, according to your word, you said, let a man examine himself. And so we come in this time of penance and examination. And Father, we thank you that we claim that you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. We believe that you were born of a virgin Mary. Hallelujah. And that you came into the world, you lived, you died upon the cross, you were buried, and on the third day, you rose from the dead. You ascended into heaven and you are seated at the right hand of the Father forevermore. We bless you that one day you shall return to rapture your church and we will forever be with you. Hallelujah. So we examine God and we confess our faith in you. Pray that you would forgive our sins and blot out our transgression. Purge us of iniquity and wash us thoroughly in your blood. We do not come to your table, Lord, not discerning the Lord's body. For we call it and we count it a sacrament holy unto the Lord. And we thank you for your holiness. And we bless you for your faithfulness to us. Now bless these thy people as we shall obey your word. That as oft as ye eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes. So we come to commune in your presence, to commune with one another, to be one with our God and our faith. 
In Jesus' name, we pray to the glory of God. Amen and amen. Before we receive communion, make sure that you share the peace with one another. Greet one another in the name of the Lord Jesus. In the greeting of the first century church, grace and peace be multiplied to you. Grace and peace be multiplied to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Hallelujah. With holding nothing. With holding nothing. With holding nothing. With holding nothing. Worship this morning withholding nothing. nothing. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. As we come to receive holy communion going to ask that you would face the inside, the center aisle, follow the direction of the ushers, going to ask that you would remain on your side so that I may anoint you with oil and then you may proceed to receive communion, return to your seat, remain standing, and we shall dine together. Let's worship.
On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread as we do ministering in his name. And he said, this is my body broken for you. And oft as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do show forth. As oft as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes. Let us die. In the same manner, he took the cup and said, this is my blood, which is the new covenant. He said, this is my blood shed for you. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. It redeems us from the curse of the law. And because today we eat of his blood and we, we eat of his bread and drink of his blood, we are one with him. Let us die. I'm going to ask that you would pass the receptacles to the person on the end of your row nearest the center aisle. The ushers will come and receive them from you. Oh! 
Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen and amen. The word of the Lord, while you're standing from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. And it reads, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. Will you look at somebody before you see it and tell them, I'm in training? I'm in training. Come on, look at them and say, I'm, I'm, I'm training, I'm training. I'm working on some stuff. I, I'm getting some stuff together. I'm in yes, I'm in training. I ain't there yet. Come on, look at him and I say, I ain't there yet, but I, I, I'm training. I'm, I'm working on some stuff. I'm, yes. I'm in a program. Hallelujah. I've got a regiment going on. Th- things, things are better. I'm, I'm training. I'm, I'm working on some stuff. I'm building some muscle mass. I, I'm dropping some weight. I'm, come on, I'm, I'm training. Not, not weight that comes from eating, but I'm talking about lay aside every yeah, and the sin that doth so, come on, easily beset us. I, I'm, you know, if you could really re- believe that you're in training and see yourself that way, you, you would find that there's more things to celebrate than there are to complain about. Come on, look at somebody and say, I'm in, come on, I'm in training, I'm training. Be seated in the presence of the Lord. We're delighted. I see uh, the presence of Administrative Assistant Dad Rosser is with us, I'm going to ask... Um, Elder Dion to go get Superintendent Rosser and bring him up to the front. He is a father of our faith and we bless the Lord for him. Let's give him a hand. Before we um, begin this morning, I want to thank God for our friends and visitors who are with us and those who have joined us over the World Wide Web through uh, our Ustream network. We're delighted to be in the presence of the Lord and to share this time of ministry from Marietta, Georgia uh, with you. To you that are first-time visitors of Morning Manor here at Greater Community, we're delighted to have you with us. And for the, our members and returning guests, we're equally so pleased. For you that have been traveling, we praise the Lord for you. want to just take a moment to uh, thank God for uh, Elder and uh, Sister Hudson. Uh, might I say the Reverend and the Dr. Hudson, who were just married. We were in Nyack, New York a couple of weeks ago. I had the pleasure of performing their wedding ceremony. And here they are, husband and wife together. Will you stand? Come on, stand up and let's just love on them. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Elder Hudson has always been known by smiling and being so wonderful. But Lord, his smile is somewhat bigger. His steps are spry. Couldn't figure out why he was skipping through the hallway. I heard him in a refrain singing, thank God I laid my burdens down. So I praise the Lord for him. We bless the Lord. I want to give you an update on our beloved church mother, Mother Nelson. If you did not know, Mother Nelson was having some health challenges, was hospitalized for a few days. Um, we bless the Lord that she is doing better, doing well, and will be home very soon. So let's keep praying for her. I want to thank the Lord for the presence of Evangelist Blue. Will you stand up, Sister Blue? And we bless the Lord for her being back in our midst, having suffered a loss in her family, and we continue to pray with you. want to lift up the family of Mother McCall, who lost her son on last Sunday. And so um, the sister, uh, her daughter, Pam, is also a member of our church. And uh, we want to just lift them up and keep them in prayer. Amen. Want to pray for Brother uh, Maceo um, Brown. That is the um, father of Sister Marcia Thompson. And uh, want to pray. He's been hospitalized and believing God for him. Thank God that Reverend Robin Joseph is doing well and out of the hospital. And I want to share with you that we visited Mother Owens. And um, she has been discharged. She is at home resting. And so we praise the Lord for what God is doing. Want to introduce to the 8 o'clock uh, service in our 8 o'clock church um, new uh, members and uh, c- 
fellow co-laborers with us in the gospel. You know that we have been going through and looking at a number of people uh, to solidify a, a very important part of our music ministry, and that is our music director and chief musician. And I bless the Lord that today from Louisiana by way of Minnesota, he and his wife were just married a week ago and they've moved to Atlanta. And I want to introduce Brother Jeremy Lewis and his wife, Sister Aria. Aria, stand up, Aria. Will you welcome them to our family? No, really welcome them to our family. I really want you to embrace them. Please personally welcome them. Uh, you know how it is moving into a new city. Wait, maybe, maybe some of y'all don't, but can I just tell you, it is difficult coming into a new place where you don't know nobody, you don't know where nothing's at. Folk looking at you strange like you came from Mars. But um, we, we're just going to make their transition a wonderful transition because they are assisting us in advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ in Marietta. I want to bless the Lord for all of our guests uh, that are here, our first time visitors to preachers that we have not acknowledged. We want to thank God for you. The word of the Lord is have nothing to do with godless myths or old wide fables. Rather train yourself to be godly. It's interesting that the apostle Paul did not take for granted the godliness of his spiritual son, Timothy. This is known as the pastoral epistles, where Paul writes 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. And he is really saying to these young elders, to these emerging leaders, that if we're going to make sure the church gets to its expected destination, it is going to require you to train yourself to be different than yourself. Can I just throw out my points because I'm, this is going to be quick. My points are, I think, I heard this morning, um, that holiness is who God is. Godliness is how I show who God is in the earth. One more time. Holiness is who God is. Say with me, God is holy. So holiness is a state of being, but godliness is an action. It's a state of me walking out. It is me being who God is. Now the text says in one of the epistles, he says, be holy for I am what? So we assume then that we can be holy like God. And that assumption is erroneous simply because God is perfect. God is come on. God is holy. God, God is holy. God is all that. God is all that and more. And watch this. God cannot increase his holiness nor diminish his holiness because if God increases who he is or diminishes who he is, then he is not who he is at all. Because God is perfect. So when he tells us to be holy, he is saying, reflect my holiness in your godliness. So it runs the risk of asking, can one be holy and not godly? Inquiring minds want to know. Well, the answer to that is no. Simply because if I'm going to reflect God's holiness in my godliness, then I've got to take the characteristics of a holy God and apply them to a mortal life and walk them out. If you were with us Wednesday, we talked about those characteristics are embodied in the fruit of the spirit. And so long suffering is a characteristic of God. And so it's a part of godliness, patience, uh, uh, growth and character are part of godliness. It is who God calls us to be so that when the world looks at us, they see him. With all of our flaws, come on here, with all of our shortcomings, it is not about a state of mere perfection, but it is about a state of absolute maturity. He says, and if you're going to grow up in the things of God, you're going to have to train yourself to be godly. That godliness is not something that's going to come on you. Godliness is something you're going to have to exercise. Come on, say, I got to work this thing out. Come on, speak, speak with me. I got to work this thing out. 
you, you, we have really kind of assumed and we've made people believe that coming to the altar, receiving Jesus Christ as their personal savior has automatically taken care of everything that needs to be done. The only thing that coming to the altar does, receiving Jesus Christ, is identifying you with the suffering of Jesus Christ and making you a recipient of the benefit of salvation. And it don't cost you nothing. But godliness requires a life. It requires that you're going to have to not be you and you're going to have to be who God has ordained you to be in him. So godliness is that I've got to train myself. Come on here. I've got to train myself to be godly. How do you do that, pastor? First of all, it starts with your thinking. That, that godly thoughts, watch this, will create a godly conversation. Godly thoughts, come on here, the what I think will, will in, inspire my feelings and how I feel will shape my actions and how I act over time creates a habit and my habit over time creates character. And so God wants us to have godly character. And watch this. You can say you're holy all you want, but act ungodly. And it begins to put God in a different frame. The world begins to say, oh, that's what God looks like? That God is not patient. God is not kind. God is not temperate. God is not balanced. God is not full of faith. God is not love. And that's what the Bible says he is. And Paul says to Timothy, you got to train yourself in godliness. You just can't make a claim of salvation and then don't do the work that's necessary. Amen. And, 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 and from our own personal examples, you, you have to be trained on your job. Am I here? Are y'all with me? When you get hired, they hire you based upon a qualification or based upon a skill that you have. Something that they believe will benefit the overall div, uh, mission of the corporation. But then when you walk in the door, somebody is going to hand you a package, an orientation. They're going to assign you to somebody and say, this is how you need to be trained to do this job. No, no, you got the job, but you don't know the job. Can I, can I preach here? I said, you got the job, but you don't know the job. And there's some things that even in your training, you're not going to really understand until you run into something that you were not prepared for, that your training did not predict. And all of a sudden, you've got to react to the thing that's before you, so you are now in training. It is the same way of being saved. I thank God that I am saved through the blood of Jesus Christ by the act of God, the redemptive act of God, sending Jesus into the the world to die on a cross that provides me the benefit of salvation but i got some work to do to be godly god is holy but i got some work to do ain't nobody talking to me sanctify yourself and the very god of peace will sanctify you holy w-h-o-l-l-y all together that's what god will do Practicing godliness is practicing conversation. It's practicing having a right mind. It is Romans chapter 12 verse 1. I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and be not conformed. There's the godliness in it. Be not conformed. You've got to train yourself to be opposite of yourself so that you can be a reflection of who God is. And so when the world looks at you and me, they see God and they don't see me. Can I give you my second point? It's easier to be me than it is to be godly. Man, I wish I had a house I could preach in this morning. It is easier to be me than it is to be godly. And all the real folks said, amen, because it doesn't take anything for you to be you. Based upon how you feel, based upon, you know, what day it is, based upon whether you got paid, based upon the fact that your friends, you know, it's just us, so we react to our environment. But oh, you, you, it's, it's difficult to be godly because I've got to do what? What I've been preaching all year. I've got to deny myself. I got to pick up a cross and I have to follow him. If you're going to be godly, then it is going to be sacrificial. You're not coming on your own and don't pull don't fool nobody and don't fool yourself that you love God so much that you're going to give up yourself. No, our response to God's love is to say, God, I lay my life down for you and I pick up your life. 
Well, I hope you're hearing me on the frequency of the Holy Ghost. Because that is the constant fight. Paul says it as we studied Romans last month. Paul says, he says, the thing that I would do, he says, I don't do. And the thing that I shouldn't do, I'm doing. And he says, I find myself warring against myself. Because he's saying there's a fight for me to be godly. God is holy. And the holiness of God, it goes without question but the godliness of our own lives are now in question and only the world will know that we are godly because we look act speak like so how do we get there pastor how do we get there the first thing i want you to know that holiness is a state of being it is also the character of god say with me it's god's character come on one more time it's god's character one more time it's god's character So when we talk about a cry to holiness, ain't nobody talking to me. You're saying that we then need to be like God. Well, guess what? If we need to be like God, the only way we can be like God is that we accept who God sent. So you must be saved. One more time. You must be saved. Not church saved. Biblical saved. Not culturally saved. Biblically saved. Not grandmama saved. Biblically saved. Not generationally saved. Biblically say it is what the Bible calls salvation and that is only through when we read it in Romans as we studied last we righteousness is imputed to us simply because we believe there is nothing that you can do there's no work that you can perform that will ever make you holy in the sight of God matter of fact it says that our righteousness is as filthy rags before him our attempt to be like God is a futile joke God laughs he bends over cracking up for me, for creation to try to act like him he is sovereign he is holy and even when God encountered his creation in the text in the Bible Moses had to take off his shoes he says because the ground you stand on is what holy ground everywhere God he says don't tell them come on in the in the the trek through the wilderness he says bring them to me but tell them don't touch the mountain because if they touch the mountain they will die why because I'm on this mountain now it was just a piece of stone it was just a manifestation of some geological uh, great work of mine but now that I'm on the stone it is holy matter of fact holiness is all through the scripture he says go and get some olive oil and beat it to the light and then go get some fine cinnamons and spices he says and mix it with the apothecary and then I want you to set it aside I don't want you to use it as a perfume because whatever you touch with this oil is going to be holy it's holy unto me and that's why it says you are a peculiar people a holy nation a royal priesthood called out of darkness that you might represent he who is is holy that's holiness and you'll never get there through without accepting Jesus Christ as Lord I gotta go but godliness without God is godlessness godliness without God is godlessness Hallelujah. One more time. Godliness without God is godlessness. And he says, because you're connected to me, then I expect you to look like me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If I brought all three of my girls and stood them right next to me, you would say, oh, my Lord, he couldn't deny them if he tried. Why? Because my children have some resemblance of their daddy. Ain't nobody talking to me. And so when the world looks at you, they're trying to figure out who's your daddy. Come on, touch somebody. Ask them, who's your daddy? Who? Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Because there are two implications in Scripture about parenthood prodigy there, there's one indication that God is father he's presented as father God and then watch this Jesus says ye are of your father the devil so that there are two implications in scripture about parenthood and so come on here in church that's why we kind of trying to figure out who's your daddy
Because if God is your daddy, then you talk like God, you look like God, you act like God. Come on here. You love like God. You're patient like God. You're, you're, you're balanced like God. You're giving like God. And you say, wow, that's who your daddy is because you act just like your daddy. But if you're lying and backbiting and full of hatred and strife and criticism, come on here, and, and not preferring one another, not giving to one another, you're of your daddy the devil. And there's only two daddies that exist in the world, and that is God the Father and Satan. Ain't nobody talking to me. Children, come on, watch this, what Paul calls them. Children of what? Disobedience. So, so when we, when we disobey God and we consistently practice disobedience and rebellion, then you are not of the holy God. You are the God of, come on, this world. Whew. Yeah, this is going to be a tight month because this, we're celebrating the life of Bishop Mason, holiness and all of that, but we got to work on godliness. Paul, Paul didn't tell, watch this, Paul didn't tell Timothy to practice holiness. The scripture does says, follow peace with all men, and watch this, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. But holiness is ascribed to God. Godliness is demanded of us. That you've got, you've got, you've got something to do in this. God is not going to do all the work. God is not going to do all the work and you sit back and claim all the benefits of that relationship without any work. I gotta go. The first thing is personal responsibility. Say with me, personal responsibility. You, Paul says, listen, you gotta train yourself, Timothy. And Timothy was personally responsible for his progress in godliness. Nobody else. It wasn't his pastor, and he had the best pastor in the New Testament. But Timothy had the best pastor in the New Testament. His pastor was the Apostle Paul. But the Apostle Paul was not responsible for Timothy's godliness. The Apostle Paul was responsible to tell Timothy, you gotta train yourself. Oh man. He says, you, you got to train yourself. He was not to trust the Lord for that progress and then relax. Though he certainly understood that any progress he made was only through divine enablement. But he wasn't to trust God for holiness. Oh, can I preach here? You can't trust God for holiness. Lord, Lord God, um, you can't trust God for godliness. God, make me godly. No, 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 no. You got to do that. Whew. One more time. You got to do that. Lord, Lord, ta Lord, take these cigarettes from me. No, I didn't give them to you. See, ain't nobody talking to me. Lord, 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 take this bottle out of my hand. I didn't put it in there. God didn't go to the liquor store. Ain't nobody talking to me. Lord, Lord, deliver me from the strip club. I didn't, I didn't create that. That's not mine. Lord, deliver me from pornography. Come on, lying, hatred, anger. He said, oh, I'm sorry. That's not mine. And what God does not author, he is not responsible for. Ooh, I can tell this is getting tight in here because now, now we're looking strange. I said what God doesn't author, he's not responsible for. One more time, what God doesn't author, he's not responsible for. So whatever the effects, the consequences of the life we live, you've got to ask who authored this. Because watch this, if, if I created this, because I, I read something the other day that said drama doesn't just come into your life. You either invite it, you create it, or you hang out with people that have it. So if your life is jacked up, you got to ask yourself, did I create this? Did I invite this? Or am I hanging with people that got this? Ooh, man, personal responsibility is tough in the Pentecostal church. Because we don't want to own up to our own end to this relationship. See, when Paul says, be not conformed to this world, he's saying you've got to fight not to be like it. Jesus says you're in the world, but not of the world. Here's he sees underscoring godliness. And then he says, if you're going to be my disciple, you've got to deny yourself, pick up my cross and follow. You have to be obedient. All of these are how we become godly. He, he would have understood that he was to work out this 
particular aspect of his salvation and confidence that God was at work in him. But he would get Paul's message that he must work at this matter of godliness. He must pursue it. That's what the scripture says. He says, pursue it. He says, train yourself to be godly. Pursue godliness. And if you're really going to have any benefit, any success in your saved life, it is going to come through your pursuit of godliness. It is going to come through your training, your practicing. You're saying, "Uh uh-uh, wait a minute, I got to take that back. Nope, can't feel like that. What? Can't say that. Up, can't feel that way. What? Got to let that go. Up, got to forgive them. Up, can't take that personally. That's how you train. Ain't nobody talking to me. It's like trying to work out, getting up early in the morning and hating the fact that you got to roll out of a bed and walk to a gym. Ain't nobody talking to me. And that you got to get on a treadmill and you keep walking and you got to lift weights and you got to do all this stuff. But after a while, you begin to slowly see the benefits of that consistency. You know that shirt that you couldn't, come on brothers, that shirt that you couldn't get into for a couple of months. All of a sudden, there's just a little room in there. And you'll be like, whoa, hey, where'd this come from? It came from you training if you would train your conversation train your response train yourself in faith train yourself to believe God train yourself not to flip out and act crazy because the enemy is acting stupid train yourself to walk in the love of God train yourself to see God in every situation God in you and watch God perfect godliness in you it is not that you are going to do it in and of yourself but it is god in you it's the holy ghost in you chiseling you and conforming you to the image of god my last point you gotta go my last point is that the second principle in holiness he says is that uh, paul's exhortation is that the object of this training was growth he says the reason why you've got to be godly is because that's the only way you're going to grow can I speak to somebody here? I said the re- the only way you you can grow in the Lord is you got to be godly. One more time. The only way you're going to grow in the Lord is that you must be be like Bishop Owens. I'm going to talk to this side of the room. The only way you are going to grow in God is through godliness. And godliness is the only way you can grow. You can grow in knowledge. You can know everything. You can speak Greek, Hebrew. You can read the Talmud. You can do it all. But if you are not growing in godliness, you are not growing in God. How do I measure my growth? It's not by how I feel. And in our church, in the Pentecostal church, the holiness church, we do more stuff by feelings I just ain't feeling you. I ain't feeling you. Something, something about you, I just, I just ain't feeling. So just because you ain't feeling me, that automatically makes me wrong. But there is no self-examination about what's motivating those feelings. Who's your daddy? Because if you answer who's your daddy, then we'll know where those feelings come from. Because there is no I ain't feeling you if your daddy's God. Because God invites us, even sinners, to him. And so I can't be any worse than a sinner. And if God would invite a sinner, but you ain't feeling me yet, you're holy. Who's your daddy? Raise your hands if you understand this sermon. All right, okay. You ain't feeling that. Raise your hands if you ain't feeling that. (laughs) Godliness, and I'm closing, I'm done. Godliness is a pursuit of the believer in order to grow in faith. I must pursue godliness. I've got to look at it. I've got to chase it. I've got to tackle it. I've got to wrestle with it. And it is also, watch this, in its pursuit, it is an examination. I've got to look at myself. And I said Wednesday, I said, um, ask someone. Go home 
Make some phone calls. Talk to your family and say, how am I in the areas? Get Galatians 5.22. Do you see me as meek? Do you see me as gentle? Have I been kind, long-suffering, patient, faith? Ask your spouse. They'll tell you. Say, I'm married, but they godless. It's the way they talk to me or the way they don't talk to me. It's the way you, you entreat the kids, the way people see you. Godliness. That's what you got to work on. You got the shout down. You don't have to practice no more shouting. You got that. You got, you got the church games down. You got to love you with the love of the Lord. Bless you. Hey, you, you got the phony smile. You got all the phoniness that church produces. You got that down. My challenge to you is what about your godliness? What about your heart? Is your heart right with God? Is it washed in the crimson flood? Godliness. Not praying over sin. Not praying over being something to impress people that don't even like you. Not trying to please nobody. But I ask myself this morning, am I godly? Is the Lord, I grew up hearing this song, satisfied with me? Ha <laughs> ha. The old saints... The ones I grew up under would rock that song and say, question, question, question on my mind. Is the Lord satisfied with me? Is he satisfied? Is God pleased? Because of the way I am being godly. Or am I confusing my witness in the world by saying that I am holy, but in my character, I am ungodly. I could care less. Fill in the sin. We love throwing off on people in church. And watch this. What kills me is, how can you throw off and be godly? You wholly throwing off on ungodliness, but you're being ungodly by doing it. I'm not here to throw off on you. I'm here to say, check yourself. Are you godly according to the word of God? Because that's what Paul says to Timothy. He says, listen, I'm about to get off the scene, but I got to know that you're going to chase godliness. You're going to have to pursue it because there's going to be some stuff you're going to run up against and some people are not going to like you, but you got to be godly. <clears throat> Matthew chapter five. Come on here. The Beatitudes, the attitude I ought to be. Blessed are the meek, for they shall, come on, obtain mercy. Come on, that's, blessed are the peacemakers. He's the, will y'all look at the Beatitudes for a quick second? You read it later, but Matthew chapter 5, he says, this is godliness. So God requires it. Jesus teaches it. Paul admonishes that the people that are going to run the church must be godly. Is that what he says? Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they, come on, shall be filled. Godliness in my attitude, my personality, my conversation, my dealings with one another. That when the saints come to, and Peter says it later, Peter says that we ought to say, uh, show a special love to those that are of the household of faith. He says, why? Because that love looks totally different than the love of the world. Because it is godliness in action. Last time, touch somebody and say, I'm in training. I'm training. I'm training myself to be what? Godly. God is holy, but I'm training on how to be godly. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for your word this morning, and we bless you that you caused us and that you call us to a place of godliness. Now may this word prick our heart by the Holy Spirit. And may we ask ourselves the, t the critical and serious question 
regarding our godliness. And Father, being godly means that we can't be ourselves. So Lord, we lay our lives down again. We surrender all, that we give all to you. We deny ourselves, we pick up our cross, and we follow you in all things. In Jesus' name we pray, to the glory of God, amen. The ushers are on the floor. I'm going to ask you to please receive an offering envelope and to bring your tithe and offerings. I want to share with you that tomorrow, tomorrow at 730 we will be ministering and, and celebrating, I should say, with Victory Cathedral Church of God in Christ with Superintendent Larry Ford. And that's at 3704 Campbellton Road in South Atlanta. And I will be emceeing their program tomorrow that um, they will be burning their mortgage. Bishop Harper will be preaching. And we're going to ask you that can and will to be with us. Uh, this Friday, the marriage ministry will meet at 7 o'clock. You're invited to join as they eat their way through Italy. There's no cost. If you have any questions, please see Sister Willard. And then um, the aerobics uh, ministry, the robotics team, will be teaching interested youth from 9 to 14 how to program, research, and create Lego robots. And so please get in touch with Elder Bernard Grace. Beloved, today we're going to ask that you would um, make sure that you register for the Music and Worship Arts Conference it is for the entire church. You will have a wonderful time. That's going to take place the 19th through the 21st. Dinners are being sold today after the 11 o'clock service um, by uh, the senior choir. Going to ask that you would please support them. If you would like to take out of uh, pro, um, an ad, uh, there will be people outside the door after this service. Even if you don't want to do an ad but you want to support, you can give a 3 or $5 contribution. Your name will go in the program bulletin. We're going to receive evangelist Barbara Jackson Sago and um, Derek Jackson, the chief Levites of the church uh, for uh, the Church of God in Christ. They will be a part, our special guests for the 19th through the 21st. It's going to be a wonderful time. I'm going to really encourage you to uh, ask and bring others with you. I'm going to ask Elder uh, Stewart to come very quickly uh, to share with the 8 o'clock service our focus for evangelism on this month. This is what we're asking you to do to, for, to be evangelistic this month. So just very quickly, and we're going to move. Amen. God bless you. Our focus uh, for evangelism for the month of September will be in the area of family uh, evangelism. So we want you to, uh, well, let me just have uh, Elder Bernard uh, Hill and his wife, Chandra, if she, they are here to stand. They are over our family evangelism ministry. So uh, we will be uh, coming to you each week, uh, each Sunday uh, throughout this month with uh, ways that you can uh, invite your families uh, you know, to church worship services, doing things with your family that will provide an opportunity for you to evangelize within the family. So that's our focus this month. We're going to ask that you would please get some invite cards that are outside in the hallway. They're the small little business cards. Please take three of them with you and then invite someone to church this week. Invite them to a Wednesday service. Invite them to Monday night Bible study. Invite them to uh, um, one of our Friday focus. Invite them to one of these services. But keep the card on you. If we are not evangelistic, if we're not growing the kingdom of God, then we're simply not fulfilling the Great Commission. We're going to ask that you would do that in the name of the Lord. Am, am I, I'm all set. All this month we are celebrating the memory and the legacy of Bishop Charles Harrison Mason, the founder of the Church of God in Christ. And we're delighted to invite you to be with us. We've ordered some prayer shawls, and those uh, will be in next Sunday. We're just going to be spending some time in prayer and prophetic praise and worship. And we're just simply going to just be before the Lord. Please do not come to any of these services this month expecting the same thing. This is a spirit-led church. Amen. And, and next Sunday, we're going to spend time in prayer, in laboring before the Lord, laying on of hands, the anointing of oil, believing God, prophetically speaking, into the life of the saints. I believe that this is our great tradition of the church of God in Christ. And so we want to continue that, and we want to pass this down to generations who don't know who Bishop Mason is. And invite you to be on the prayer call that you will hear various voices. This week, Bishop Mason, we played Bishop Mason, Mother Elsie Shaw, uh, Bishop uh, Owens and Bishop G.E. Patterson. 
And then this week, you'll, this coming week, you'll hear other voices from the church from yesteryear of those who have laid in prayer. We're just simply building on a foundation that's already laid. Amen? Standing in the house of the Lord, will you face the outer wall? Bring your tithe and your offering to our guest. You are under no obligation to give.